Iowa Administrator's Licensure from Drake University. In 1804, President Thomas Jefferson commissioned a group of men called the Corps of Discovery to explore and map the land of the North American West, the recently acquired Louisiana Purchase. To lead this expedition, he chose Meriwether Lewis and William Clark. This morning, we will travel with Jim as he leads us in an examination of that extraordinary undertaking. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Jim Gilbert. Well, I've actually never used one of these before. So uh, it's kind of like an airplane pilot. Uh, thank you all for coming. Wow, what a great turnout. Um, I can only assume that, um, that the cost of your tickets was cheaper than the Taylor Swift uh, <laughs> concert. So, so you got in here uh, with a pretty good deal. That's really great. Um, the topic today, yes, is the, <coughs> the Lewis and... Clark Expedition. We're going to have a little fun uh, taking a look at the, the vast journey that these, these folks undertook and, um, and their bravery. And <clears throat> First, we're going to explore uh, a little bit about the geopolitical circumstances leading up to the expedition, including um, why President Thomas Jefferson at that point uh, thought it urgent to undertake such a project. And once we go a little deeper into the expedition itself, uh, you may come to appreciate a little bit more about the subtitle that's listed here. My interest in this topic um, basically comes down to a couple of experiences that I had. One was from early childhood, and another was uh, from a, a recent, more recent trip I took out west with my wife. Um, my childhood, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, or, or the suburbs thereof, and, um, and in the place where we were, <coughs> there were still tracts of land that were undeveloped. Um, but there was the, the competing um, development of shopping centers and office buildings. And so these wooded areas, you know, uh, as a boy, I would see them kind of begin to shrink and shrink a little bit more and so on. But across the street on South Taylor Road, there was a patch of woods that was still left, probably no bigger than a, maybe a half of a city block. Uh, but to me, this was the edge of wilderness. And at nine or 10 years old, uh, I would kind of sneak over there. Um, my mom didn't really know about this. Uh, and I would take my backpack <clears throat> and my canteen full of water and my, uh, my little pocket knife from Cub Scouts, and I would spend hours in these woods uh, sitting and watching and exploring. Um, and uh, although I could hear the traffic, they couldn't see me, and so this must be the wilderness. And I was just in wonderment. I remember, the, like it was yesterday, the feelings of, gosh, I am probably the first person ever to be here. And, um, and then, you know, uh, sooner or later, I, I finally discovered some rusty pop cans. But even then, I remember thinking, all right, at worst, I'm the second person <laughs> ever to be here. Um, a more recent uh, inspiration for uh, this research came, in fact, this week last year. Uh, my wife and I took a trip to Yellowstone National Park and the Grand Tetons, and you know we followed the usual route of uh, Iowa to the Missouri River, and then northward uh, to South Dakota, North Dakota, Montana, Wyoming, and all along the way, um, I began to see billboards uh, referencing Lewis and Clark and markers along the road. Lewis and Clark, Lewis and Clark. And I, I, you know, I kind of got the picture that maybe I was going the same direction. Um, and it wasn't until we, we actually stopped at a, at a rest area. It's a small town in South Dakota called Owakama. And Owakama 
uh, sits right on the Missouri River, and uh, it's across the, the river from Chamberlain, South Dakota, and there's a rest area there. And, um, you know, we thought it was going to be a 20-minute potty stop, and it ended up to be uh, over two hours that we spent there because it turned out to be an educational center um, devoted to the... Um, uh, the entirety of, of the Lewis and Clark expedition. And we, we got in there. There were, you know, uh, biographical information about Lewis and Clark, replicas of the boats, the keel boat and the pirogues that they used, which we'll talk about a little bit more uh, a little bit later on. Um, copies of the diary excerpts, um, um, video footage. I mean, just anything that you can imagine. Um, and I was just intrigued by it. <clears throat> you know, as a kid, I would... I would remember in social studies, you know, seeing one or two pages <coughs> of, uh, you know, the famous poses of Lewis and Clark in their buckskins with, with uh, Sacagawea, uh, also pronounced Sacagawea, uh, and, her, and her baby, you know, just sort of the romantic notion of, uh, of what this expedition was all about. But um, uh, it, it wasn't that romantic at all. In fact, it was very arduous, as, as we'll learn. But anyway, this was just intriguing to me, and then uh, all along the rest of our, our uh, vacation, I paid attention to <clears throat> any, uh, any signs or information that we could get. And when I got back, I, um, I decided that um, I was going to spend time researching this. Well, we're going to begin with kind of the lay of the land um, to explore a little bit how the Lewis and Clark expedition even came to be. Um, this is a map of the United States and how it looked in, the, in 1800. And basically, at that time, there were 16 states in green and then <clears throat> some, um, some territories, you know, beyond that. And as you can see, you know, you go east, you're along the coast, you've got the, th that's where the colonization started, everything happened there, so the, uh, the crux of the population, the heaviest population is uh, along that east coast in those states areas. As you move west and you get uh, past the Appalachian Mountains, there's certainly uh, still um, uh, some settlements, uh, American or United, uh, American settlements that take place. But what's really interesting was uh, there's a lot of British and French um, settlements as well and trading posts all in the Mississippi River Valley and up the Mississippi River itself and even up the Missouri uh, River itself. And then you get west of the Mississippi and there's these vast uh, expanses of land and we know this, this one in the middle uh, that is the, um, the Louisiana Territory. Uh, it has France in parentheses, but um, as we'll see in a moment, Spain had it and it went back and forth between France and Spain. Interestingly enough, Iowa was a part of the Louisiana Territory. You can, if you can, if your geography is great, you can see where it sort of juts out into the orange up there, um, where where eastern Iowa is. Um, so, we also want to want to consider what's uh, what's south here. Okay, down in, into the Gulf of Mexico, the uh, the whole area of New Orleans. That's a that's a big deal. In, in 1800, 1801. Um, New Orleans and the, uh, the area around that is part of that territory, so it's not been settled as a, as a state yet. Um, this map of, of the, some of the major rivers shows the importance of New Orleans. That sort of purple line uh, is the Mississippi River, and you can see that um, you know, major rivers flow into the Mississippi, and the Mississippi flows out of the, the port at New Orleans. Um, this is important because all of the, the manufacturing, uh, the farming, uh, and any, any kind of trade that happens uh, makes use of the Mississippi River. So people living in the Ohio River Valley, the Tennessee River Valley, all along the Mississippi River, um, their, uh, their access to goods comes from imports that come in and up the Mississippi and, uh, and their exports, their shipping, of course, uh, uh, is, is the reverse and, and uh, going out of the port. So control of this port is a, is a big deal. Um, no trains, planes, or automobiles, so it's all by boats and ships at this point. And, uh, 
And all parties, they, meaning the nations that were hovering around, were all competing to control this, okay? The Spanish, the French, Great Britain, and the United States all want control of New Orleans. Um, in 1801, Thomas Jefferson becomes president. Also in 1801, Spain signs a secret treaty with France to return the Louisiana Territory to France. And uh, that was in a deal that they made because they, they wanted to form an alliance with France against Great Britain. Um, also in 1801, 1801's a busy year, Napoleon Bonaparte comes to power as Emperor of France. And uh, we'll find out, or Jefferson finds out a little bit later on, that his goal is to mass an army and get that army into New Orleans so that they can claim it as a French colony and thus control all the, the import-export uh, to the interior of the country. Um, France also controlled the island of Saint Dominique, which we now know today as Haiti. And uh, Haiti is just a little south, uh, uh, a bit from Florida, Cuba, Dominican Repub Republic, and Haiti. And so you can, you can imagine the, 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 the proximity. I mean, it's fairly close to Florida and fairly close to, relatively close to um, uh, uh, New Orleans. <coughs> but his idea <coughs> was to, to mass an army. They, uh, the French, uh, controlled Haiti, of course, and um, basically they had a pretty good deal there. They've subjected the people there to working under the French rule to form a sugar colony. Um, but during this time, um, the, the Haitian people um, were, uh, were not happy because the working conditions and the exploitation was so bad, they decided that they were going to have a revolt. And so they started to push back against the French rule. And Napoleon got word of this, and he said, uh, no, no. We've got, we've got plans here. So he sends thousands and thousands of troops from France to Haiti. And you might, might think, well, gosh, Haiti's such a small place. That's a bit of overkill. But, um, but he had an alternative, an uh, ulterior motive, all right? He wanted to s use Haiti as a staging point, all right? And so get all these troops to Haiti. We're going to quash the rebellion. Then we're going to move from Haiti right up into, uh, <clears throat> into New Orleans take it over, and then that's going to be the new France. Well, this turned out to be a pretty unsuccessful venture. Uh, once, well, first of all, when the soldiers got there, they met more resistance than they had anticipated. But secondly, and probably more importantly, um, they contracted yellow fever. And so uh, estimates are uh, as much as eight to 10,000 troops, three-fourths of them are decimated by yellow fever. So the whole thing is a failure. Now, Jefferson finds out about this. Um, he doesn't, uh, you know, there's, there's a lag, of course, in communication because you can't text, right? Um, so, but he, found, he finds out about, about Napoleon's uh, uh, idea, and right away he orders uh, the U.S. minister to France, uh, Robert Livingston, to uh, get into the French government and, and try and get with Napoleon and offer to buy, just outright buy, New Orleans. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll put a little pin in that right here because I, I have a little footnote uh, that I, I, I acquired from Gene Wubbles about another person that, um, that uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, contacts. He has of course, contacts in the higher echelons of government and business. And so he enlists the help of a fellow by the name of Pierre DuPont. And you recognize the name DuPont from the DuPont Chemical Company. Well, uh, Pierre's son and his descendants actually formed the company. But Pierre himself was, uh, was an author, uh, a writer, and a bit of a media mogul, a, a publisher. And during the French Revolution, he kind of got into a little bit of trouble with his viewpoints in, in his publications. So fearing um, you know, safety for his family, he immigrated <clears throat> to America, but he still kept uh, business operations in France, and he would go back and forth. Well, Jefferson uh, knew of him, and uh, I was able to find a letter that Jefferson writes 
um, even to, to Pierre de Pont. And in the letter, uh, he's saying, hey, um, here's the deal. We're in a little bit of a fix here. I know you have some influence in the, in the higher circles that you run around in. If you can get with Napoleon and convince that guy that, that uh, this is a good deal uh, to, you know, for us to purchase New Orleans, be appreciated. Well, it turns out Napoleon didn't need much convincing at all. In fact, he was desperate. Having lost three-fourths of his troops um, and still at war with Great Britain, Napoleon decides, I need money more than I need land. So Napoleon just surprises everybody and, and uh, wants to sell the entire Louisiana territory, including uh, New Orleans. So um, Robert Livingston, the, the U.S. emissary, uh, jumps on it and says, okay, we'll do it. Um, so they, uh, our government, the United States at that time, acquired 828,000 square miles 828,000 square miles of land for $15 million, all right? Now, in working this out, I did a little bit more research. This, this worked out to four cents an acre, all right? And this was considered Jeff one of Jefferson's most um, uh, notable achievements. Um, now, Jefferson recognized that there was some urgency in formally establishing some presence and governance in this newly acquired land. So we bought it, it's on paper, but he conceives of an expedition uh, that he wants to send out to survey the region. Uh, he wants to establish American presence in this territory before the competing European powers get out there and set up their establishments. Even though we own it on paper, he doesn't want to fight another war over land. So he conceives of this, um, this expedition He's also interested in finding a route directly from the Mississippi or from the Missouri River to the Pacific Ocean. He wants to, uh, to uh, discover a waterway because if we could do this, he's thinking, then we've got the upper hand in all trade uh, across the country, right? So the West Coast all the way to the Missouri River, we've got the Mississippi, we've got New Orleans, and of course, we already um, uh, are, are prominent on the East Coast and the, all the trade that, that, that comes from that. So he commissions an expedition and he, and he calls the expedition the Corps of Discovery. And uh, he appoints Captain Meriwether Lewis to head up the uh, ex expedition. Meriwether Lewis, interestingly, was serving as Thomas Jefferson's presidential secretary at the time. And um, he was formerly a, a, a captain in the military. And so uh, Thomas Jefferson trusts him like, like the back of his hand. But he wants to prepare him. So he sends Lewis to Philadelphia for six months of intense education. And he meets up with the, 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 the best scholars in specialty areas. He studied botany, celestial navigation, geology, and medicine. So Lewis accepts this appointment and, um, and then decides uh, he's going to select a co-conspirator in all of this, if you will, and that is uh, William Clark. Um, now these two meet by some pretty odd circumstances. Uh, when they were in the military, they were in separate units, all right? And Lewis um, is a captain, but he gets sideways with one of his superior officers. In fact, he really has a, a, quite a, a, a spiff with this, with this guy. And he gets drunk one night, and he challenges his superior officer to a duel with pistols, which is kind of a no-no in the military. So he has to face a court-martial. And uh, he goes through that, and uh, he's acquitted of, of you know, the most egregious charges. But they transfer him. They say, yeah, we gotta, we got to move you out. So they transfer him to another unit, and guess what? This unit is captained by William Clark. That's how these guys come to meet. So they work in the military together. They form a great relationship. William Clark, by the way, is trained as a sharpshooter, um, but uh, he's more known for his uncanny cartography skills. So the accuracy of his map-making was... Um, 
just incredibly valuable, not only to the expedition, but to further westward movement as other people followed after, uh, after they were done with their mission. Jefferson describes the mission to Lewis in a letter, and I'm going to read a little excerpt from that letter. He says, to Meriwether Lewis, Esquire, Captain of the 1st Regiment of the Infantry of the United States of America, the object of your mission is to explore the Missouri River and such principal stream of it as by its course and connection with the water of the Pacific Ocean that it may offer the most direct and practical water connection across the continent for the purposes of commerce. Jefferson really wants this water connection from the Missouri to the Pacific. The president also gives the following assurances. He tells these guys, hey, um, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to contact uh, the ministers of France, Spain, and Great Britain, and I'm going to let them know that we're coming through. And they're to let their people know, who's ever out there, not to interfere or impede with your progress whatsoever. Also, the United, State, uh, United States government is going to provide all the provisions for the trip. Things like all the instruments you're going to need for celestial navigation, light articles for barter, presents for the Indians, arms for the crew, boats, tents, traveling apparatus, ammunition, medicine, surgical instruments, food, on and on and on. Jefferson is a very detailed man, and, um, and he, he knows exactly what he wants. Um, he gives them a few more orders, like uh, the following. He wants them to collect information along the way about the native people, right? He wants the names of the different nations, their population, their latitude and longitude. He wants the, their language. He wants to know about their weapons, the diseases that they have, the cures for their diseases. He wants to know about their food, how they prepare it, how they preserve it, on and on and on. He also wants them to collect uh, information and samples of soil types and the plants that grow in specific areas. Um, he wants specimens of vegetables, animals, minerals not yet known to the U.S. Now, Lewis and Clark didn't go into this completely blind. All right? Now, they had done some research of their own and were gathering information from explorers and fur trappers that had already traded with the native people and um, especially up and along the Missouri River. In addition, four years earlier, a captain by the name of Robert Gray uh, of an American trading ship sails all the way around um, North America, South America, and up the West Coast. And among his discoveries, uh, he discovers this place called the Columbia River. And so he maps a little bit of it. So... Lewis and Clark basically know that there's this great river that exists out there, and it comes east. Um, they know that the Missouri goes north and west, but they don't know how or anything about if they connect or the vast land that might lie in between. On May 14th, so May, it's nice weather, 1804, the Corps of Discovery launches from St. Louis, Missouri. Here's some pictures of the vessels that they use. And this is the keel boat that I mentioned earlier. And this, um, by their standards, and to go up a river, this, this was kind of a beast. It was 55 feet long. It had 16 sweep oars. It had a mast and a sail. It had push poles that, uh, that, that guys could use. And... Um, and it, it had a 12-ton capacity, so it could carry quite a bit of supplies. On board, 45 people, consisting of 27 unmarried soldiers, a professional boat crew, a French Indian interpreter, and a slave named York, who was owned by Clark. In addition, there were two pirogues. And uh, a pirogue is just uh, an embellished huge, oversized uh, canoe, all right? But it's, it's stout. I mean, it's 35 feet long. It's eight feet wide. And, um, and these canoes can carry, these pirogues, uh, can carry quite a bit of supplies with them. Based on the information from the traders and others, Clark had already completed a map from St. Louis to what was thought to be the Mandan 
village uh, camps up near um, uh, Bismarck, North Dakota. Maneuvering these boats was, uh, was an interesting feat. Um, when they were in deeper water and the wind was good, they could use the sails, right? And they could use the oars and have no problem whatsoever. But when they got to parts of the river where there were sandbars and obstacles, they had to stand up and use long push poles to try and get around these, uh, these different obstacles. And in really challenging circumstances, they had to use tow ropes, believe it or not. The men would get out of the boats, attach the ropes uh, to the boats, and they would, uh, on shore and all the muck and everything, they would try and pull these boats through the, the worst of conditions. Um, the entire essence of, of this journey, of course, is, is captured in the daily journals of Lewis and Clark and four other sergeants that they had uh, also make entries along the way. And historians used all of the, uh, of the journals to corroborate the accuracy and gain a really clear picture of what's going on. Um, I'm going to be referencing and reading from some of these uh, authentic uh, journal entries uh, I like to read the actual words of these explorers because I, I feel like it brings a much more intimate connection with them as people and really provides a window into their way of thinking, uh, the way they thought about their mission, about their colleagues, about their fears and their joys, and, um, and their worldview as they get out and, and encounter native peoples that they've never met before and land that they've never seen before. I'll be using the term Indians and probably interchanging with, with Native Americans because Indians was used in their journal entries and by the researchers whose work um, I, have, uh, I have looked at to, uh, to form this um, presentation. I want to credit um, some sources here. Uh, first of all, I want to start with the University of Nebraska Center for Digital Research in the Humanities because they have amassed the complete collection of the Lewis and Clark journals. And that was uh, as a result of collaborating with the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Center for Great Plains Studies, and the University of Nebraska. I'd also like to acknowledge the following sources. Uh, author Stephen Ambrose in his book, Undaunted Courage, Meriwether Lewis, Thomas Jefferson, and the Opening of the American West. And thanks to Bridget Brandt for lending me that book. Harry Fritz. Professor of History at the University of Montana and his contribution of essays and research uh, to the online source called Discover, Discover Lewis and Clark. And then finally, Gary Moulton, who spent many, many years uh, studying the, uh, the journals. He's the Thomas C. Sorensen Professor Emeritus of American History at the University of Nebraska. And his book, The Lewis and Clark Expedition Day by Day. Here's a couple of entries that were made just a couple of weeks after they launched at St. Louis. On May 25th, William Clark writes, rain last night, set out early, passed several islands, passed Wood River on the leeward side, camped at the mouth of a creek called River Chature, above a small French village of seven houses and as many families, settled at this place, convenient to hunt and trade with Indians. Some hard rain this evening. People at the village is poor. House is small, but they bring us milk and eggs to eat. This is said to be the last settlement of whites on the river. The next entry, uh, farther along in their journey, is interesting because it illustrates a problem that happens at least a half dozen times on the first half of, the, of, their, of their venture. And that is of men getting lost on land while they're out exploring or hunting uh, or, or what have you. Um, it's from Sergeant Whitehouse on May the 28th, and he writes, This morning was fair, and I went out hunting with several of our men for the day. On my route, I discovered a cave on the south side of a fork of a small river, about a hundred yards from that said fork. I entered the cave and proceeded about a hundred yards underground and found a small spring in it. I think it one of the most remarkable caves I saw in my travels. I should have proceeded further into the cave, but it being dark towards the further end and having no light, I was forced to return. On my arriving at the river, 
I found that Captains Lewis and Clark had proceeded on without me. <laughs> However, they did leave a pirogue uh, with some men uh, and hands waiting for me. On hailing them, they came across and, uh, 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 to pick me up. We proceeded to camp, took dinner, after which we proceeded on with the pirogue, the barge having gone ahead of us by two hours. Well, wondering how this type of situation might be viewed by the captains, uh, I paid particular attention to the journal entry the very next day by Clark. And uh, he didn't really mention a whole lot. I mean, he makes a casual reference to the guys getting lost. He writes this on May the 29th. Had the pirogues loaded up and prepared to set out at 4 o'clock after finishing the observations and all things necessary, but found that one of the hunters had not yet returned. We determined to proceed on and leave one pirogue and seven Frenchmen to wait for him. Several guns were heard below, and I expect the Frenchmen were firing for White House, who was lost in the woods. So this was a typical protocol, <clears throat> as I learned. If a man got lost while out scouting, <clears throat> excuse me, or hunting, the party moved on. But they would always seem to leave a transport behind. And then um, those, those people in the transport would fire their guns in different intervals. And the guns served as a beacon. So if you're out and you hear a boom, okay, it's over here. And then a little bit later, boom. And you get to follow the sound back to, back to shore. So this is the map of the route taken by the Corps of Discovery, and we're going to use it as we, uh, as we uh, complete their travels here. Now, this was a military expedition, right? Lewis and Clark were captains, and they run the ship with a pretty tight hand. Uh, in June, just a month after they, uh, they set off, uh, one of the soldiers is accused of stealing whiskey while on watch. And so a court-martial happens, they find him guilty, and Lewis and Clark decide they're going to make an example of this guy. He gets a hundred lashes for everybody to see. Um, three weeks later, a Private William falls asleep during guard duty. And in the military, this is one of the most egregious offenses you can make, because if you're put on guard duty, um, you're responsible for the lives of everybody. So, uh, unfortunately, they make uh, uh, an example of him as well. He gets a hundred lashes on each of four successive days. So there's no question here that they, <coughs> they are sending a message to everybody on, <coughs> on this journey. On August 2nd, the group is now 640 miles from St. Louis, and they make their first contact with a settlement of uh, uh, Native American uh, people. Um, the Missouri and the Otto tribes. And they, of course, have scouts along the river and they see uh, the, um, the, the Corps of Discovery coming and they're elated. In fact, they, they meet them by bringing gifts of watermelon. And, um, and Clark uh, reciprocates by providing pickled pork, cornmeal, and flour. And then they agree to have a great council meeting the next day. They call it the Great Council. In fact, Lewis ends up naming this encampment Council Bluff. But it, it's actually south of the Council Bluff that we know. But nonetheless, uh, he, he gave it that name. Now, the Missouri and the Autos actually merged as, uh, as tribes because their populations were decimated when they, um, when they caught smallpox, which was, which was brought over from the Spanish. And... Being vulnerable now with small numbers, um, there was the warring Sioux Indian Nation, and the Sioux Indian Nation was ruthless, as you'll, as you'll see later on. So better to have uh, uh, numbers and, and be safe. So these two nations have merged <coughs> at this point along the river. Um, the council itself was a big rehearsed production, okay, and so... I mean, they've got this down. They put on all the regalia, the feather hats, uh, you know, the armaments, and they're, they're marching in front of the native people who, who then I, I put myself in their shoes and think to myself, hmm, you know, what, what are we watching here? You know, and, uh, but they made a big production. Um, and then Lewis makes a short speech with an interpreter. 
And the interpreter will either try and speak the native language or he'll speak French because there were French fur traders living in many of these, uh, these Indian settlements. So it would kind of go like this. Lewis would start out in English and pause. The French interpreter would uh, translate it to French. The French person who might be living with the tribe uh, translates it to their native language. And if there's any reciprocal communication that has to come back, it's got to go back that channel. So it's really kind of an arduous task. Um, but Lewis makes a short speech. And uh, basically, uh, the message goes like this. And this is kind of scripted uh, out of their journals. We come in peace. We're sent from the new great father of the new country called the United States. A great council meeting was had between the French, the Spanish, and, uh, and this new country, the United States, um, is, is now the land. The land is no longer your land. It's the land of the United States. Lewis continues, by accepting this, the great father who rules the United States will provide you and all tribes with goods and trade and protection. And also, no nation, no Indian nation must interfere with any white explorers that come this way from this point forward. Or else, you will receive no trade, no goods, and no protection. The ceremony also includes the firing of a cannon that was mounted on the keelboat. And, um, and this was done for, uh, you know, what you might realize uh, kind of an on-purpose sort of thing. The Indians were both fearful of it and fascinated by it, but it makes a point about here's the power. But then gifts were given to the Indians, all right? And, and listen to this. They had already printed medallions with the likeness of Jefferson on them, all right? So these metal medallions, they were giving these out to the Indians. And then there were paper certificates. And even though the Native Americans couldn't read or even understand the printed word. Um, you know, on it, the, uh, the, 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 scri the scribes said, um, hey, this land now belongs to the United States. Thanks for agreeing. Um, you know, here's, we're giving you all the rights for trade and, um, and protection. And, uh, <clears throat> and then uh, in addition to that, they gave tobacco, colored glass beads, fishing hooks and line, and most, uh, most of the tribal people accepted this with optimism and even gratitude. Some were reluctant uh, and, and, and wanted more gifts. Um, these tribes are, are, are kind of savvy because they'd already become dependent a little bit on the trade with, uh, with some of the French and British uh, uh, people that they've seen earlier. But most complied with the declaration and, um, and uh, the Corps of Discovery headed on farther north. It's time for a break. You'll have to come back to see what happens. There'll be a 10-minute break. Listen for the bell to come back. Promptly. And once again, Jim Gilbert. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in school, uh, uh, after recess and the kids came in, we, and there was a lot of hubbub, we would say, stop, freeze, look at me, please. So I, I think I, I did fail to mention that, um, that their encounter with the, uh, with the um, Missouri and the Auto uh, takes place where the number one is uh, along that river, just, <coughs> just north of where St. Louis is. Um, so I'll try and remember to, to yell the numbers out as we go along. So as they, they headed north, um, they, they weren't uh, in the water for very long when one of their sergeants becomes extremely ill, uh, Sergeant Charles Floyd, um, and they minister to him with the medicine that they know of. <clears throat> he has severe uh, abdominal and stomach pain. Uh, unfortunately, on August the 20th, he dies, and um, historians have, have indicated that it was likely a ruptured appendix uh, from, you know, <clears throat> and, and they, they really couldn't probably have saved him. But he's buried with military honors uh, at a monument um, uh, marking uh, 
there's a little headstone there right on the river, as you can see, a little white icon. Um, so um, they proceed north uh, after he's buried with military honors, and uh, the landscape now starts to change. All right, trees are becoming more scarce. They become limited to, the, to rivers, along the banks of rivers. The rolling hills that we know of, about Iowa and <clears throat> um, turn into flat plains. And there are some journal observations that sort of uh, capture the beauty and the transition um, that takes place. So here's three different uh, 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 journal entries that are made at three different times as they progress north. One is from William Clark who starts out by saying, great quantities of plums of a most delicious flavor. I've collected the seed of three kinds and intend to send to my brother. Also some grapes of a superior quality and well flavored. The river is rising. Several goats, wild goats seen in the plains and they are wild and fleet. Uh, there are elk and buffalo. Scarcely any timber in this country except by the little on the river. Sent out some hunters today. They killed three bucks, two elk, which we jerked. Then Sergeant Glass, a little, uh, uh, a little while uh, later, writes, Sergeant Drewer went out today and killed an elk and a beaver. Numbers of catfish caught are many. Those fish is so plenty that we catch them any time and any place on this river. The mosquitoes are thick and cannot be avoided. And then Meriwether Lewis, um, who writes fairly eloquently, uh, and, and uh, make note of the wildlife that, that, he, um, that he sees here. He says, the scenery is already rich, pleasing, and beautiful, and was heightened by the immense herds of buffalo, deer, elk, and antelopes, which we saw in every direction, feeding on the hills and plains. I do not think it an exaggeration when I estimate the number of buffalo which could be calculated at a single view to be 5,000. Moving the keelboat and the pirogues against the current, as I mentioned earlier, could be an arduous task and required uh, a tremendous effort from each man. So when it came to rowing, um, pushing with the long poles and even towing the boats with the ropes while walking on the banks, there was considerable energy and calories uh, that were burned. The meat consumption by these men during uh, this portion of the trip. Listen to this, eight pounds of meat per man per day. Okay, so I mean, I'm thinking about my trip to Fairway <laughs> for a pound of ground beef, all right? So it was absolutely critical to hunt, collect fruits, nuts, fish, edible plants each day. The food preservation was also essential. Uh, the meat, as they mentioned, was, also, was either jerked or it was pickled and, uh, by putting in, uh, the meat into barrels with salt. And then any fresh meat they had, of course, had to be consumed like during that day. By September 23rd, the Corps goes uh, farther north and now believes th themselves to be in Sioux Indian territory. Now, they had been warned uh, about this, this nation as being a warring and ruthless power. So they ready themselves by getting out the ammunition and, and making the weapons easily accessible. So they make camp near Pier, South Dakota, which is number two on the map. And they do have an encounter with the Sioux tribe. In fact, this encounter uh, nearly gets the entire expedition killed. Here's what Clark writes. Two teenage Sioux swim across the river to our camp and make contact with us. We give them tobacco to take back, along with an invitation to their leaders to have a council, a great council meeting, the next day. The next morning, the Sioux chiefs come, but bring hundreds of warriors. These warriors line the banks. They have arrows and bows. Um, all of our soldiers have rifles with them. The, uh, the keelboat is strategically then moved from shore out into the, to the more the middle of, of the river. And, um, and soldiers have their rifles and, um, and are manning the, uh, as, as a lookout. So Lewis and Clark, 
as they start, Lewis starts his, um, his oration uh, with, the, uh, with the, the Sioux, realize that their language translation isn't going to work, all right? There are no French fur traders living among the Sioux, all right? So, and, and the translator that they have didn't really know much at all about that native language. So, um, there's a lot of room for miscommunication here. So, Lewis, by gestures, sign language, um, whatever he can use, shortens his speech. But the same basic message, right? This land now belongs to the new nation of the United States. The great father of this nation is going to provide you with everything you need, goods, trade, and protection. And then here's the gifts. Well, the gifts are presented, but the chiefs are displeased. In fact, some of them actually throw the med medallions back into the river. Uh, some of them tear up the, uh, the, the, the certificates. And what they demand is they want what's on that keelboat. They want uh, the goods on that keelboat. But Lewis refuses and says, hey, we need those provisions for our trip uh, that lies ahead. So there's a standoff now. And, um, and the chiefs are, are, uh, basically say, well, you're not getting out of here unless we get what's, what that's, what, what's on that keelboat. Well, through some negotiation, they're able to convince the chiefs that how about a ride on the keelboat? And the chiefs think, oh, this is great. So the chiefs come, they escort them onto the keelboat, and they, you know, they un, un, unlatch it from the moorings, and they take a ride. While on the keelboat, the chiefs demand whiskey. So they're smart. They've, they've been around, so to speak. <clears throat> well, they accommodate the chief, and they bring out some casks, which they uh, consume quickly. And as that happens, the chiefs get intoxicated and really rambunctious, and they refuse to get off the keelboat. <clears throat> so now... Lewis and Clark are, are kind of stuck, so they summon their soldiers and uh, bring over a pirogue, and they escort these chiefs off the keelboat onto the pirogue with Clark, and they take them to shore. However, once that boat gets to shore, uh, the warriors surround the pirogue, and, uh, and they seize the pirogue. Clark draws his sword. Lewis calls uh, the soldiers to arms, they, uh, they, they load up their weapons, <clears throat> and so there's a standoff. And so now bows and arrows are out, and they're standing face to face. And finally, Lewis gives the order to light the taper for the cannon. Now, the chiefs recognize this and decide, um, okay, we're, we're, we're probably not going to win this, uh, this round. So they call their, uh, their warriors off, but... Lots of negotiation has to happen in order for them to uh, achieve a safe passage. And what they settle on is, we're going to leave you some extra provisions of tobacco if you uh, let us go and, um, and, and be on our way. And so that's agreed upon, and uh, they were glad to get out of there. Uh, so the expedition moves on from number two on the map, uh, heading north, they travel another month between two and three to get up to the Mandan Indian villages near present-day Bismarck, North Dakota. Um, once they reach that place, they have traveled 1,600 miles. All right, and so that's number three. The Mandan villages uh, have a population of about 4,000 people, and they consist of the Mandan, uh, the Hidatsas, and then refugees from many other nations who were either plagued by smallpox uh, or had escaped <coughs> the warring Sioux. And uh, this was sort of a, a refugee place for them. Now, the people in this village were tremendously friendly and helpful. I mean, they helped the expedition repair their boats and their equipment. After 1,600 miles, there's a lot of wear and tear on this stuff. Um, and it being the end of October, November, it's now coming in a winter time, uh, and north ha uh, winter happens a little quicker up north. So Lewis and Clark decide, okay, we're we're going to make a camp here, and we're going to we're going to stay the winter. So uh, on the other side of the Missouri River, they make Fort Mandan, and they named it that way on purpose to honor the people there. Um, during their nearly five month stay, um, they. Uh, have some uh, uh, experiences that are very important. Number one, 
they meet a, a guy named Toussaint Charbonneau and his two wives, one of them named Sacagawea, and you may know her as Sacagawea. Um, uh, that pronunciation goes both ways, and I might say it uh, uh, both ways. Uh, but Charbonneau is a, a, a private fur trader. Now, he used to work for the Northwest Fur uh, Trading Company out of Canada, and now he has come to live in and among uh, these Indians in this village. He's a bit of a scoundrel, but um, they love him because he can still get good stuff from the, the French. Uh, and, um, you know, armaments and tools and, and th hardware and that sort of thing. But he's got two wives, and, uh, and he's a bit of a, uh, of a carouser. Um, Sakagawea, his wife, one of his wives, is a Shoshone Indian, and she was captured by the Hidatsa tribe when she was only 12 years old. Now, the Hidatsas are, are uh, migrating, and they go to, you know, they, they move around to different... Uh, hunting grounds um, in, at different times of the year. And they were out raiding what they call the, the Shoshone uh, territory. And while they, were, while they were there, they snatched her up and brought her back. Um, she's now 17 years old, and she's pregnant with, with Charbonneau living in this vill village. So Lewis and Clark learned that the Hidatsas were, were friendly, although, you know, on the other hand, they stole this girl from her people. So they have to kind of reconcile that. They know that Charbonneau's a bit of a character, but as they plan their travels further west, Charbonneau offers his services um, as an interpreter. He can speak French, he can speak Hidatsa, and he offers up Sakagawea as she knows the Shoshone uh, language. So once they realize that they're going to be going into Shoshone territory eventually, um, they take him up on his offer. And so he's allowed to uh, come with the group along with Sacagawea. As I said, they spent five months wintering at Camp Mandan, Fort Mandan. And smartly, they, um, they do a couple of other things. They interview members of the, of the tribes that live there, particularly those who had been out west. And they're able to talk to people who at least got to within viewing distance of the Rocky Mountains. All right, because it's, it's a vast country, all right? You, you don't think, well, it's, uh, the Rocky Mountains are a half an hour away. That's, that's not the way it works, all right? So they, they, they talk to these peoples, and the Hidatsas would describe rivers and plains and canyons and landmarks, um, and their estimates of distance proved to be pretty accurate, um, uh, so accurate that Clark was able to make a map of, of where to go and, uh, and how, to, how to follow. Uh, there's another fellow that uh, lived with the, the, the core of Discovery, and his, his name was Private John Shields. He's a blacksmith by trade, and he's enlisted to help in the Indian village. So he helps fix the broken and worn out tools that they maybe got from the French. Um, he also helps them repair their more traditional uh, tomahawks and axes and, uh, and then he's able to take, take some of the, the metal that they got from the French and forge those into arrowheads, which they had never seen before. So he was a valuable commodity. In fact, he was key in bartering for corn and vegetables, which was desperately needed uh, to uh, supplement that steady diet of meat that we all know they were, uh, they were taking on a daily basis. Um, but during these months, the, the core of discovery really bond with this tribe, and it's, um, it's really evident in the, uh, in the journals that, uh, that are written. Um, the men share stories with one another. They learn the language of one another. Uh, the, the core of discovery, the, the guys participate in the native ceremonies. They hunt buffalo together, uh, and they live pretty peacefully. By, Aug by, um, I'm sorry, by February, Sakagawea gives birth uh, to her first son, and she names him Jean-Baptiste. In March, the ice breaks up <coughs> because, as you know, the Mississippi, the Missouri is just frozen solid during these winter months, and so the ice begins to break up in March, and plans are made to, uh, to move on 
But they decide to send the large keel boat and six men back to St. Louis with all the specimens and soil samples, soil samples that have been collected thus far. And this shipment uh, would eventually make its way all across the country to Thomas Jefferson. So Lewis is sending something like 108 botanical specimens, including the first known purple cone flower, 68 mineral samples, including lead ore and pyrite, salt and pumice, um, skeletons of the pronghorn antelope, the mule deer, uh, the white weasel. And he also sent three live animals in separate cages. They sent a prairie dog, a magpie, and a grouse hen. Um, it turns out only the prairie dog survived. But on April 7th, then, um, they decide to launch. The keelboat heads south uh, back to St. Louis, and 39 remaining members of the expedition continued in the pirogues, and then they had to also craft some canoes to take the place of the keelboat. And of course, the people in the Mandan village, the Native Americans in the Mandan villages helped them craft these canoes. Um, the, um, the interviews, uh, as I said, with the, the, with the Hidatsas paid off. Uh, the, the descriptions were, were really accurate, um, and the, the mapping seemed to give them a, a, a good course of action until they reached some ambiguity, and there was always going to be that, but there were tributaries and some rivers that uh, weren't mentioned, and uh, sometimes they, they got uh, into a little predicament about which way to go. Well, Clark would then disband a couple of scouting parties, and uh, one scouting party would go up one river and another up another river, and sometimes this would take days because they had to be sure they didn't want to take the wrong river, right? And then get to the end and find, oh my gosh, this doesn't go anywhere. So, um, uh, so they, um, they, they moved on uh, and ended up uh, getting all the way up to Great Falls, which is number four uh, on the map, Great Falls, Montana. Uh, they ended up there in June, about mid-June, and the big surprise that they ran into was that the falls covered a 12-mile stretch. A deep gorge dropped 400 feet over five different cascading falls. Um, by the descriptions that they had received back at the Mandan villages, they were thinking, well, we can probably portage that in about a day. <laughs> yeah, maybe two days. Some of you are laughing. You maybe have been there. Um, it took them a month. It took them a month to, to get around the Great Falls um, uh, area. In fact, um, they just had too much to carry. They had to take one of the pirogues and stash it. Um, and so they find a place and camouflage it, and they, they put in a, a few caches of ammunition with it, and they're thinking, yeah, we'll, we'll use this on the way back. And uh, <clears throat> you'll see that that was a smart move in just a few minutes. Um, well, the portage was arduous. They even had to build hand carts, so they had to cut slices of trees and make wheels and axles and carts, and, the, and the, the men would then pull their provisions on these carts through pathways that hadn't been made yet. Um, so once the portage was complete, um, they had a little more travel difficulty because there were even more tributaries and streams. Remember, the farther west you get, um, um, the, the, um, the, the more inaccurate the, de the descriptions were, right? Because people just hadn't gone that far. So, but now here's what happens. Stroke of luck. Chicago Wea now recognizes this territory. They're in her domain, right? Her tribe would migrate <coughs> in and around <coughs> these places. And so she takes over and she guides the expedition. She sits right at the front of the boat, which also serves as another purpose because what they, what they thought was if we put a woman and her child at the front of the boat, uh, nations uh, will see this and, and they'll say, okay, you know, these, these people aren't armed. They're, 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 they don't mean any hostile <coughs> uh, intent. But uh, anyway, so she's at the front now, and she's saying, okay, we need to go this way. I recognize this landmark. Um, and she takes them all the way to Limi, the Limi Pass, which, which is number five on the map. Um, 
and that is, that sits right on that's in Idaho sits right on the Continental Divide. <coughs> Along the way, I, I just want to make note that she also um, is very adept at uh, recognizing plants and roots which are edible. So when the hunting is sparse, uh, she, you know, they, they didn't have any, um, any want or need for food at that time because she would supply all the vegetation that, was <coughs> that could be cooked and eaten. Um <coughs> so she was invaluable. <coughs> On August 17th, they make first contact with the Shoshone Nation. They, of course, the nations always have scouts out and they're sighted. And, uh, and again, I try and put myself in the Native American shoes to, to say, uh, you know, they've never seen white people. And, the, you know, here comes these pirogues and, what's, and these canoes and what, what's going on here. Um, but as they get closer, <coughs> um, Saka, uh, Saka, uh, Sacagawea, Sacagawea, uh, is identified. There are a few people in the tribe that recognize her, and she recognizes them. And so they, they come ashore, and they land the boats, and there's this huge celebration and a, and a great sense of relief. And listen to this great luck. Her brother, Kamawait, is now the chief. All right? Right? Coincidence? Right? So here it is. He's now the chief. And oh my gosh, there's a reunion like you can't believe. And so Lewis and Clark are thinking, oh, my goodness. Uh, you know, we're saved. This is great. Well, after some, uh, some celebrating and some, um, you know, some time to, to eat together and so on, Camoweight does share the bad news. He says there is no water passage that connects the Missouri to the ocean. There is none. And Lewis is devastated. He is heartbroken. Um, uh, as we might talk about a little bit later on. He's also prone to depression, and so he isolates himself a little bit during this time. But Camoweight does share this. He says, there is a path, there is a way to get through the mountains, and we know it. It's the Bitterroot Mountain Range, and um, you may not be able to see it so well here, but if you start at the number five and go toward the, the number eight, that's the Bitterroot Mountain Range. So... Um, and we're, not ta we're talking part of the Rocky Mountains, all right? So this is, this is huge stuff. Um, and, he, and, he, and he offers this. He said, I'll tell you what, we, he didn't talk like I'm talking, but uh, through, uh, through interpretation of Chicago Wea and so on, he says, I will sell you the horses that you need because it's all on foot by now or from, from this point on. So they make a deal. Um, she got the expedition there. Um, they, uh, they reach an agreement to uh, trade their, their pirogues for horses. And um, he even, uh, Camoweight, her brother, even uh, uh, provides a guide. He said, I'm going to give you a guide that's going to get you through this mountain range. Um, it's going to be very difficult because in the mountains, the game is very sparse. You're not going to have a lot to eat. We can't provide you with a lot because we don't, we haven't stored up a lot. We just, we consume what we hunt, right? We don't have large stores of food. So they begin their, their trek through the, the Bitterroot Mountain Range with a Shoshone guide and horses. Now, it's the, uh, the end of August and September, but the nights are already freezing temperatures. They get snow and they get rain. In fact, just three weeks in, to, um, to their trek through this mountain range, 39 people, their food sources are depleted. They can't find, just like uh, they were warned, they can't find uh, much to hunt. And now it's becoming deadly. They're near starvation. So they make the difficult choice that they've got to kill a couple of the horses. And so they do that, and they, they butcher the horses, and they eat um, uh, the horse meat. That sustains them for a few more days, but... More good luck. They run into a tribe of Salish Indians who happen to uh, migrate through that area. The Salish are friends with the Shoshone. And so the guide knows the language. And again, you know, they're saved. They can get respite. Uh, the, the Salish take them in for a few days and offer them what they have, which are just nothing more than cakes of berries and plants. Doesn't sound great. But to starving people, this was, uh, this was a lifesaver. 
Uh, then they traveled on. They spent another 11 days. And remember, they don't know how long it's going to take, right? So day after day after day, n no one knows. But by the 11th day, they're back to that same situation. They're starving. Um, more luck. They run into a couple of scouts from another Indian nation called the Nez Perce or Nez Pierce uh, Indians. And they have scouts riding all around. They happened upon these scouts. And again, they're friends with the Shoshone. So the language barrier isn't a big deal. And they talk, and the scouts offer to guide the expedition back to their village, which is down on the Great River, which holds lots of salmon. And boy, you know, their eyes got big. And uh, this is number six now on the map. So they come out of the Bitterroot Mountains, and they're heading west, and the, the Nez Perce, the Nez Perce settlement is where uh, that number six is located on the map. Um, they are also very friendly. So they're, they're welcomed, and again, the Native Americans help mend clothes, and they provide, um, you know, they provide tools, and uh, mostly they provide food. What happens, though, is that everyone in the expedition gorges themselves on dried salmon and berries. And uh, that, that proved to be really a bad deal. Uh, for the next two weeks, they were all violently sick with uh, stomach illness and dysentery. And having diarrhea out there and not being able to stop it is a dangerous thing, all right, um, from a nutritional and... and um, um, you know, being able to stay hydrated and that sort of thing. The sickness <coughs> is obviously um, uh, thought by Lewis and Clark to be um, because of the drastic changes in diets and going from starvation to all of a sudden this rich food. And also likely from bacteria, which they were unaccustomed to, that was probably on the fish that they ate. Um, but they received good news. The the Nez Pierce say that um, they confirm that this body of water can get them all the way to the great water that they seek, the ocean. So Clark makes an agreement with the Nez Pierce to leave all of their horses and tells them, hey, you can have all of these horses for your use uh, for as long as we're gone. <clears throat> and, um, and then on our way back, we'll get them back from you. And they're delighted you know, for that deal. So they strike that deal. Uh, I want to just read a, a little journal that, that Clark, an entry that he makes. He says, men sick as usual. All the men are able to, uh, uh, all the men that are able to work are at the canoes. Captain Lewis, very sick. Most of the men complaining very much of bowels and stomach. <clears throat> so it's not until October the 7th that they're well enough to, to get going. The Nez Pierce are so accommodating that they even send word down river uh, to say, hey, there's this group of white people coming. They're peaceful folks. They don't mean any harm. Don't give them any harm. Um, and so that was really a relief. They were told that it was going to take one full moon to get to the great water. And that was pretty accurate because they left on October the 7th and they arrive at the ocean on November 5th. Um, so Clark writes, great joy in camp. We are in view of the ocean. This is the great Pacific Ocean, which we had been so anxious to see. The roaring and noise made by the waves breaking on the rocky shores is wondrous and may be heard distinctly. So now this is number seven on the map. They discovered many, many native settlements around the mouth of the Columbia and the estuary along the coast. And the, there were two prominent tribes. One was the Clatsops and one was the Chinook. Most noticeable was that some of the attire and possessions of these Native Americans were of European manufacture. All right. They were, people were wearing captain's coats. They had swords. They had pants and shirts not made of uh, deer and elk skin. Um, they had painted canoes, uh, uh, rifles. Pots, kettles, and all sorts of things. And so they were like, wow, um, I guess people are circumnavigating the globe. And they realized, though, that, that trade um, was going to be a big thing if they could make it happen. Um, 
But the focus now was to build a fort because they had to spend another winter here uh, or another winter uh, was coming. And so they named it Fort Clatsop after one of the prominent tribes in the area. But they spent four months here and during that time they had to do hunting and jerking and food preservation. They had to make new clothes. Um, they had to repair tools. And uh, a big issue was they had to update the journals because Jefferson was particular about this. He wanted everything chronicled. And during their time that they were star uh, starving and just trying to survive and, and sick and uh, there, there wasn't time and so they left, they left a lot of gaps in these journals. So they spent a lot of time uh, writing and catching up. Um, the journals indicate that their stay at this particular camp was awful. It was dreadful. Uh, they tried to trade with the Indians. The prices were so uh, exorbitantly high, they couldn't, they couldn't bargain for hardly anything. And um, the other thing was that during the four months, it rained all but 12 days. All right. And so they were, it was depressing. Um, by March 23rd, they pulled out of there and they were glad to leave. And so you figure March 23rd, they're going to get back to the Nez Pierce. It took them a full moon to get to Fort Clatsop. It's going to take them a month to get back. And by late April, they make it there. Uh, back, we'll go backwards to the number six. And they're met with, of course, very accommodating and celebrating people. Hey, it's great to see you again. And, um, but they want to be on their way. Hey, it's, it's great. We can't spend a lot of time with you. We need our horses. We got to go. And the, but the, the tribal leaders say, can't go. All right. You can't go because the snowpack is so awful in the mountains, you'll never make it. Well, Lewis and Clark say, well, we're, we're pretty well-traveled people. We're going to go. So they get the horses, they pack them up, they leave. And guess what? Several days later, they turn back and they come back. Uh, and they're there. How much time do we have? Okay. All right. So we got we to gotta go a little faster. Um, there's some important things that happen here. Um, by June, they could, they could leave. And the Nez Pierce say, look, we know you're in a hurry. We're going to provide a guide who can get you through, take a shortcut through the mountains. So they do. They get to number eight. All right. Number eight is a, a place called Traveler's Rest. And right there, they decide to split up. Um, Lewis is going to go north with a group. Clark is going to go south with a group, marked by the L in the C. Lewis goes his way. He encounters Blackfeet Indians. They follow him. Um, they, he feels kind of threatened, and rightfully so, because one, in the middle of one night, they awaken, and the Blackfeet are trying to steal their weapons and their horses. Lewis and another sergeant have their weapons ready, and they shoot and kill one of the Blackfeet Indians. The rest of them get away. So now they're worried about reprisal. So they... Uh, hustle back down to the pirogue that they stashed, right? They get in that thing and they hightail it down the river as fast as they can. In fact, in his journal, they rode those horses for 24 hours to get to that pirogue. It was nonstop because they were so afraid. In the meantime, Clark goes uh, south along the uh, Yellowstone River. He has the same problem. Crow Indians Although they're a little nicer, they pretend to be nice, they camp, they even have a meal together. But uh, they wake up one morning and they were a little uh, more careful. They took almost all of the horses. So now they're left stranded uh, right along the, where number nine is, uh, along the, Yellow, the Yellowstone River. However, there's timber there now near the river. So they have to take the time to cut that timber down and carve out canoes. Uh, that'll take them the rest of the way. Uh, so that takes a bit of time. Lewis is already at the letter X. And Clark follows some days later and they meet up. And Lewis says, hey, I think there's people hot on our tail. We need to get going. So they get down to the Mandan um, uh, village again at number three. And people are elated, of course, to see them. And they have a great, uh, a great reunion. However... The Mandans reveal that they've been attacked by the Sioux. And the Sioux have killed a bunch of their people, in in, uh, including one of the chief's sons. Another chief comes and begs Lewis, take me back with you. I want to meet the great father. I want to tell him about our people. 
uh, about our situation and, uh, and provide information to him and be of service to him. To the astonishment of everyone, Lewis agrees. And he takes this Indian chief back with him. Um, so they, um, they leave uh, uh, the Mandan uh, Reservation uh, on August the 17th, and they head out. But they leave behind Charbonneau and Sacagawea. They pay Charbonneau $500, offer him land, 300 acres, if he ever wants to come uh, east. And Clark is so thankful for Sacagawea that he says, hey, if ever you need any assistance with your son, I will take him in, I will be his godfather, uh, I'll even pay for his education. Um, and uh, and in a, 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 a later time, many years later, that does happen. Um, the group makes it back to St. Louis on the 23rd of September, and uh, they complete a, a journey of 8,000 miles over a two-year period. And in closing, I, I just want to say this. I, you know, I can only imagine um, how they must have felt, the, this group of people, as they engaged in, in this expedition uh, to encounter land never seen before by, by uh, white people, um, and to know that there was just a drop in the bucket. There was so much more out there um, to communicate and learn from the different native nations and to realize their hardships and appreciate their customs, learn their language, uh, their reliance on nature, and to understand their fears and even the warring attitudes of their enemies and to receive the hospitality and friendship and guidance that most certainly contributed to their survival. I think it can be said that Lewis and Clark and their entire expedition got by with a little help from their friends. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jim, yep. for taking us back in time and helping us understand how the core of discovery came to be and its legacy for decades afterwards. It, their spirit of exploration and courage of its members make it a really, really remarkable story. Yeah. We look forward to seeing everyone next Wednesday, September 20th, for the next bucket course entitled From Beijing to Venice, The Arts of the Mogul Empire, Mongol Empire, presented by Grinnell College Associate Professor of Art History, Aaron Shea. We hope to see you then. And I think if there are any questions that people would like to ask mm -hmm. Jim, I bet you could just come on up here and oh, ask yeah. him. And he, yeah, I'll stick yeah. around. That's fine. Yeah. I'm going to take this you. thing off. <laughs>